used to, but I am very excited about tonight's Messianic Midrash. Um, and so those of you who are, are here live, of course, you have an opportunity to look at um, the folders that you have in front of you. Those of you who are online, I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to share some things with you as we get started um, and then begin to move right into um, today's lesson um, after prayer. And so we are starting, of course, at the beginning. So here we are in our Messianic Midrash. We are starting in Genesis chapter one, verse one today. And every week when we come together, we're going to get as far as we can get. <laughs> and then we'll stop. Um, because if we try to cover a certain amount of material, it may not work out that way. You know what I mean? It's, it, we don't know how much we'll get to cover with the discussion, with the questions, especially dealing with the Hebrew. So we're just going to get as far as we can get every, every Wednesday um, in an hour. And then we're going to keep going um, from that place. And so tonight we're starting at Genesis chapter one, verse one. Of course, next week, I'll be letting you know, we'll start at the next verse after the one we end off on today, wherever we end today. And so, of course, um, in this Bible study, again, this is Messianic Midrash. Um, um, this is going to be the Bible study that replaces, it's replacing our God Speaks Bible studies that were at 12 noon on Wednesdays. Now we'll be gathering at 7 p.m. Um, on Wednesdays in Petersburg at Holy Ground Ministries. Praise the Lord. Um, and so apparently my phone isn't used to being out here in Petersburg, <laughs> so I'm not getting a good signal. Um, but praise the Lord for just a wonderful opportunity to get together um, here at Holy Ground. I bless the Lord for Pastor Rudy, um, Lady Gwen, Pastor Raquel, just being a blessing to us. And so a uh, midrash, as you'll see in front of you, means textual interpretation. Literally in Hebrew, that's what it means textual interpretation. Historically, a midrash has been a Jewish mode of interpretation of holy scriptures. Usually this is by a rabbi that reveals a contextual meaning as well as a deeper meaning of the words and even the letters of the sacred text. Hence, our Messianic midrash is a Holy Spirit-led study of the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation to reveal divine interpretation and life application for believers in Messiah Yeshua. Now, what that means is I'll be sharing some things, um, some Hebrew words, Hebrew letters that give deeper understanding of the text. I'll be sharing context, um, especially from the, the Jewish cultural perspective that we would really understand the Bible, even in the New Testament, which was written in Greek, it's still from the Jewish cultural perspective. So there's like Hebrew idioms, things like that, that you would only understand from the Jewish cultural perspective. So I'll be sharing those type of things. But additionally, I'll be breaking down words, letters, meaning, deeper meaning, so we can apply it to our lives. This is not just a scholarly study. This is so we can be more like Yeshua. And the Spirit is leading me as to what I should teach and how I should teach it. Because when we start looking at the Hebrew, the well goes deep. We could, we could teach on Genesis chapter 1 for one year just Genesis chapter one. Um, we're not going to do that. <laughs> if we get through it tonight, that'd be awesome. If not, it might take us two weeks to do. Um, but we're going to go through what the Lord said to go through. Um, and so we will go a little bit deep, you know, um, but for people who are really Hebrew scholars, it'll be just scratching the surface, but it'll be for us so that we can really apply this to our lives. That's really the point, not just to know something, to know it, it's to know it so we can apply it. But there will be rhema revelation that the Lord has given me for you guys, like even for tonight, I'm so excited. There's a lot of rhema revelation, meaning you can go and look up these scriptures and the words that I'm going to give you tonight. And, and the rabbinical teachings, and you're not going to hear everything I'm going to share tonight, because some of it is what the Holy Spirit is downloading for us today. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and that's important that we recognize that. Um, but it will be true, of course, to, to um, ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, um, and God's original intent, and also what he's trying to speak to us at this time. So now I um, want to make sure you guys understand that our Messianic Midrash is the Bible study um, that is a part of the congregation that we're planting in the Central Virginia area um, called Congregation Or Shalom. Now, Or Shalom means light of peace in Hebrew. And God has had us actually have services up in the Richmond area since we've been here. We've been here for six years, um, but we went online. Everything was online during the time of COVID, and now the Lord is really having us to establish what he wants to do in Central Virginia. Uh, the, the desire is to be based out of Richmond, but right now the Lord is allowing us to be here in Petersburg, and so we, we want to serve the whole Central Virginia area, so we just bless God for an opportunity to be here at Holy Ground. 
Now, um, Light of Peace, as we look at that name, Congregation or Shalom, Light of Peace, uh, the scripture that I want to give you comes out of Luke chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 79. And this was speaking about our Messiah, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet to the, into the way of peace. And that's really what God has called this congregation to do in this Central Virginia area, because there's a lot of darkness. He's been speaking to me a lot about that. Um, but he wants to release his light and he wants to guide people into that light so they can walk in a way of peace and that's really shalom shalom is peace rest and wholeness there's a lot of brokenness and he's trying to make us whole and he wants to use us as his lights you know in this area to help other people um, who are broken to also be whole. Um, now or shalom congregation or shalom is under the apostolic umbrella of the truth and the spirit and so remember that because there's going to be a lot of connecting stuff with the truth and the spirit. <laughs> and so when I say the truth and the spirit, or if I say congregation or shalom, it's all one big, you know, apostolic family. Um, but congregation or shalom is specific to the Central Virginia area. And the truth and the spirit is, you know, a global messianic apostolic ministry. And the truth and the spirit is now based out of Antioch House of Worship in Hayes, Virginia, which is such a, a, a tremendous blessing because at some point in the future, um, literally starting on Yom Teruah, we will have simultaneous services in Central Virginia here and at um, Antioch in Hayes and then also online like we are right now so that no matter where you are, you can join us. Uh, but for those of you who are in those two places, you can actually join us live and we'll be connecting to each other which is awesome. <laughs> and so the next thing I want to share with you guys as we go forward um, is the Hebrew Aleph Bet. And so you guys, um, you'll see in your folders a little chart. There's a chart in there. It's kind of got a blue um, border because this is going to be, it looks like this, it's going to be foundational to what we're, what we're talking about today and every day is the Hebrew Aleph Bet. Now, the reason I say alphabet instead of alphabet is because alpha is the first letter of Greek of the Greek language and beta is the second letter of the Greek language. In Hebrew, the first letter is aleph and the second letter is bet. So instead of saying alphabet, which is Greek, Hellenistic, we say alphabet, <laughs> which is um, Hebrew. Um, and so what you'll see um, in front of you are going to be all of the Hebrew letters. And there's lots of information about them. When I need to highlight stuff, I'll highlight it for you. Um, so we won't be looking at all the letters today. We're going to look at two letters today and three words <laughs> if we get through all the text. Um, but we will definitely look at the two letters. Um, and so what you'll see here is that the first letter um, I left, you're going to see that all the way to the right and the, on the top line. And the reason it's to the right is because Hebrew is read from right to left. English is read from left to right. That's going to be important with all the stuff in this folder that I gave you guys so that you know when you're looking at Hebrew letters, whenever you're looking at Hebrew letters and words, it's from right to left instead of left to right, um, which is going to make a difference as we're looking at it and as we're comparing. OK, um, and again, this is it's going to be kind of surface level, level, but for some people, this is a whole new language. Um, and so surface level is, is still deep. <laughs> it's still very deep. So please let me know when you have questions. Um, it's very important. This is why it's a Bible study and we're going to get through whatever we can get through. I don't have a goal to get through so much text because then I wouldn't, I would have to rush to your questions. I don't want to rush to your questions. I want to make sure your questions are answered. And so if we start in Genesis chapter one, verse one, um, you're going to see, when look at verse one, it reads, and I'm reading in the complete Jewish Bible, and I'm reading, of course, in English. <laughs> this is how verse one reads. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that first phrase in the beginning is summed up in one Hebrew word, Bereshit. And if you're looking at any type of you know, Jewish Bible, this whole book is called Bereshit, in the beginning. So the first word in the Bible in Hebrew is Bereshit. That's the first word in the Bible because it means it means in the beginning. But rather than looking at that first word, I want to look at the first letter. The first letter. And this is so important because really everything else that's going to show up in the Bible, every single thing, the whole message of the Bible, the message of salvation, all of it is summed up in that first letter of the Bible, which is bet. And so we're going to start off by looking at bet. 
and then we'll keep going. And so that's the next page in your folder is the page that says bets. <laughs> You'll see uh, what it looks like. And so I want to share this with you guys who are online as well. I want to make sure you guys can see it also. Um, there we go. That first letter of the Bible, bet. It's the second letter of the Hebrew Aleph bet. So Aleph, that first letter Aleph is going to be the principal thing. It's the first thing. Aleph, all, it, it kind of represents God. He's the beginning. He's the first, you know what I mean? Um, he's the Aleph, right? Um, or like in, in, in Greek, the Alpha, right? Um, but Bet being the second letter, it's going to speak of covenant. Bet speaks of agreement because it's that second letter. It also speaks of establishment. Um, when the Lord firmly establishes something, he will confirm it for us, right? He'll give us a confirmation. The confirmation is saying it the second time. Also, he said, where two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst. So if there's two, it's established, he's there. He also tells us in the Torah that every matter be established by two or three witnesses. So if it's two, it's been established. And so that, that, that letter bet, because it comes with that um, numeric value of two, speaks of that establishment, speaks of the covenant, speaks of the agreement, speaks of all those things. But literally, it means house. It literally means house. That's what bet literally means, is house. Now, what you're going to see um, with it meaning house, and I'm actually just stopping to share my screen just because something showed up on the... Um, Broadcast. I just want to make sure they're still broadcasting. Looks like it might be. Um, but let's go back to the screen. What you'll see with the house, and I know when you think about an English house, it's not how we draw houses. <laughs> so I remember when I first was learning Hebrew, I was like, that wouldn't no house. <laughs> don't look like a house. But let me explain to you why it's a house from the Hebrew perspective. So it's got the foundation, right? It's got the wall, it's got the roof. But what you see is a continual, forever open door. There's always an open door in this house. And this house is very important because this is going to be house from the mindset and the heart of God. So when you think about house in Hebrew, it speaks of us all dwelling together, of course, you know, like in a building, a family in a building. But house also speaks of a family lineage. It speaks of generations, like the Bible will say the house of David. So speaking of the household, it's speaking of the generations that come from him, it's going to speak of family. So house doesn't just mean people who just happen to live in the same place. And it doesn't just mean the building. It speaks of the house of us being together as one. And so if we are a family and we're in covenant, remember that, and our family has been firmly established, remember that, see all that's in this word, in this letter, then the door is always open to members of the house. You can grow up, you can get your own family, you can move out, but the door is always open because you're still a part of this house. And that's the way God sees family. That's the Hebrew mindset of family. The door is always open. Like bet as a letter doesn't even have anything there that you could close the door. Like <laughs> there's nothing there for you to close the door. The door is perpetually open. And this is key because again, it's being the first letter of the Bible. What we see is God establishing his house. He's establishing his family. With the Bible, God is establishing his family. He's establishing his house. And this is what you're going to see in Genesis chapter one. You're going to see the Lord building his family um, and always with an open door, always welcome to him. Even again, that plan of salvation. Why? To make sure the door stays open. Even when we close it with our sin, even when we walk away from it, even when we're independent like the prodigal son, I'm going to do my own thing. Give me my inheritance. He always has the door open. And the Bible itself shows us the keys to come back. If you lose your way, if you, you're just out there stuck somewhere, you're struggling right here. This is how you get back in the house. Because the house is not just a building. You're part of the family. You are perpetually a part of the house. So all you have to do is come back. And, and this is so important that we understand that because this is where he starts the scripture. 
Do you understand what I mean? He starts the scripture with that letter, bet. And in Hebrew, when you look at words, the meaning of a Hebrew word is going to come from the letters that make up that word. So when you think of any word in Hebrew that starts with bet and it has that, that b sound, um, like, like to bless, baruch, you blessing your household. You see what I'm saying? It starts with bet. Both son and daughter start with bet. So you got bar or ben and you got bot. Bar and ben are son, bot is daughter. Why? Because they're a part of the household. So all these words that start with bet have that meaning of that family household, the generation, the lineage within the word. So Hebrew words are always like that. When you take all the letters and put them together, you see a meaning to the word, which is why the Hebrew words are going to have so, such, um, so much of a, a, a deeper meaning than just their transliteration. Because each letter in that word has a meaning and it brings its meaning to the word to, to give a composite meaning of that word. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so when we get all of this, we, we, we see that it's like the Lord was, was, was singing to us. He was writing to us. He was revealing his heart to us. He was calling us to himself right from the beginning, from Bereshit, <laughs> from that first letter back. I'm calling you to me. I'm establishing something. I'm in covenant with you. You're a part of my household. You're my son. You're my daughter. The door is always open to you. You're always welcome. And I've written an entire book. So you know how to get back to me in case you go too far away. That first letter back, that, that right there, that is his love to us. That's his message to us. That is the salvation message. It's all right there, right there in that first letter. And, and this is, again, is how you miss it when you do all the transliterations, because, you know, in, in English, it starts with I, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it, it doesn't have that, doesn't have that meaning in it. Um, you're just trying to translate the general meaning, but to translate the deeper meaning of Hebrew would take books and books and books and books and books and books and books. It couldn't be just one book like we have with the Bible to translate this deeper meaning would take so long. And so it's just important when we look at it that we get this understanding, go, whoa, he was, he, look at all that he put in here. And the closer I get to him, the deeper I go in my study, all I'm going to find is his character and his love and his plan for me, because you were planning from the beginning. That's why Bet has an open door. You were always a part of the plan from the very beginning, from very sheet. <laughs> he had you on his heart and on his mind. And you want to keep that in mind as you go through everything else that we see in the scriptures. Um, so that's going to be important for us. So now, um, now that we, we, we looked at bet, let's keep going in the scriptures. So we, we read verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was verse one. And of course, God is, 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 is speaking of all of him. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you're going to see the, the other two. See, you, when you see God, you think the Father, right? But you're going to see the Holy Spirit in verse two, and you're going to see Yeshua, the Son, in verse three. They were all there together. Why? Because again, he was establishing his house. He already had himself as a house, <laughs> right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, already right there together. Then he creates children and gives us that same image, that same house, that same family, so now let's look at verse two. Um, and this is how it reads in the complete Jewish. The earth was unformed and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. Um, now there's so many different translations of what verse two says. Like lots of different ways it reads. In the NIV, it says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In other versions, like the King James, it'll say the earth was in chaos. Um, but there's some type of void, it says, but in darkness is always there. Now, I want to talk to you guys about, you know, these words here, the way they actually appear um, in the Hebrew. So let's start with the next letter. And then I'm going to go to the next word. So we're still looking at verse two. We're looking at verse two, Genesis chapter one, verse two. I want to encourage you to go to uh, your next page and let's look at the next letter. Okay, so we were at bet. 
Now we're going to Vav. Now, if you remember from your chart, because you guys have your chart, um, and for those of you who are online, I'm going to go back to your chart so you can see it. Um, Vav is going to be the, the sixth letter, sixth, number six. It's the sixth letter um, on your chart, and it carries a numeric value of six. That's the value of, of Vav. So remember that it carries a numeric value of six, and it's the sixth letter. Now, Vav is going to be a hook, um, a spear, a tent peg. It, it's something that connects, and then it, it, it solidifies that connection, hence the tent peg. So the tent peg is going to connect the tent to the ground, and it, and it keeps it rooted in the ground, it keeps it connected. The Vav is a connector. It hooks, connects. And, and, and maintains that connection. Now, Vav can sound like a V, usually it sounds like a V, but there are times when it sounds like a W, and there's times when it even takes on the, the, the linguistic quality of a U, the letter U, making that uh sound. Um, and that's important to note because you'll see Vavs in weird places. Like, there's not a V right there. It might be making a W or a U sound. Um, and Bet, which I didn't tell you, makes the B sound, sometimes it makes a V sound. Sometimes bet makes a V sound. And so it's important to remember that when we go to this next word that we're about to look at. And so um, if you click again, I'm clicking, you guys turn over because you're in your notebooks. You're going to see that word that is translated as um, chaos in some versions of Genesis chapter one, verse two. Other versions, is it's that void or unformed. So what you're going to see is chaos at the top of your page. It's chaos in quotations, because that word doesn't actually mean chaos. But you see chaos, you'll see void, you'll see unformed, you know, all those things to try to translate what was said, which is tohu vavohu. That's what was said, it was tohu vavohu. So when you see chaos, when you see unformed, when you see void, it's tohu vavohu. That's what's actually there in the Hebrew. Now, tohu as a word, which you'll see on your page or on the screen, means wasteness, that which is laid waste, desert, emptiness, vanity, nothing. That's what tohu means. Now, va, as it, it literally, when you look at that above, the va is just the, it's just the vav itself, that one letter vav, that word, that, that portion that says va, it's just the one letter vav. Now, you remember vav is, is a connector. So va, tohu, va, vohu is a connector word. It could mean to, it could mean and, it's a connector word. That va is a connector word. So tohu, you see the meaning there. Wasteness, that which is laid waste. Desert, emptiness, vanity, nothing. That's tohu. Va is a connector. And vohu is actually, it's a, it's a repeat of tohu to give greater meaning to tohu. And I'm gonna give an example like in contemporary, in our contemporary language to explain it to you. So like, for example, let's say you were at an amusement park. We got Kingdom Inn up here, y'all got Bush Gardens down and other places, but just you're in an amusement park and somebody goes on a roller coaster. And on the roller coaster, she goes through a loop. And you might say she went through a huge loop. Somebody else might say she did a loop de loop. So when you added the loop de loop, the point was to say it was a real big loop or it was a couple of loops. You were adding emphasis. Does that make sense? So we look at tohu by vohu. The vohu is adding emphasis back to the tohu, which has that same meaning. Waste, nothingness, vo, you know, that's what that means. And, and there's only three places in the, in the scripture where you're going to see that phrase tohu vavohu the lord says it here and you're going to see it in jeremiah and in isaiah when we get there i'll point it out to you guys but the point is when you see it in those two scriptures it's pointing back to here so it's a unique word that he uses a unique phrase that he uses right here pretty much only right here except for when it's referenced back to right here Nobody says that like in language, nobody's going to be saying tohu vavohu. Nobody says it. Like it's, it's not something that's said. So he specifically used this language for us. He's telling us something here in verse, verse two when he says tohu vavohu. Like he's telling us something. Now you'll see the letters 
um, on your um, on your on your worksheet, or you guys who are online, I'm gonna put it back up on the screen again. You'll see the letters. Now remember, we're looking at from right to left. So if you look at tohu vavohu, the first letter you see is tav, because we are all the way at the right. We're all the way at the right. And now it's back. <laughs> so let me share my screen again. So apparently we're having another signal challenge. Um, let me go back to sharing my screen. Uh-oh, well, let me do it. Uh -oh. Dispense. Oh, I'm there. Trying to share my screen with you guys. There we go. Now it's let me share it. All right. So what you have is top, uh, top hey. Vav, which looks like it just looks like a line here. We know it's got a little hook at the top normally, but when it's printed out, it's just a line. So there's this, there's the tav hey vav. Okay, then you're gonna see vav again. You see vav again in the next line. So the two vavs there that was to t and h or so tav and ha to, and then that that that, that vav is making a u sound. So it's to who. That vav, that first vav on the right is making a U sound. Then you got another vav. Now it's making the V sound. See the one that's got, it looks like it got a little T under it. That's the vav that's making the V sound. Then beside that, remember that's our house. That's bet. Bet is now making a V sound. V is making a V sound. Even though it's, it's bet. I told you it can make a V sound. Then you got hey again, because that's going to be vahu. And that last vav is that is a U sound again. Now you don't have to remember all of this. You don't have to remember all of this, you guys. I know this is like day one. When I tell you why I'm telling you this, you're gonna go, oh, got it. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's not for you to remember, not that you need to understand how to read this. Cause like I said, you'll never see this word anywhere. Nobody says it. It's only here. It's really only here and two other places in the Bible when they actually reference right here. That's it. Why did God give us this word? Why did he give us this word? Well. Remember what I told you guys about Vav. What is Vav's numeric value? Six. How many Vav's do we have in this phrase? Three. Six, six, six. We have three Vav's in this phrase. We also have a Tav, which speaks of fulfillment of purpose, signature, end of a matter. We've got uh, hay, which speaks of the breath of life. And we've got bet, which is a house. Now, if we understand, because we are Messianic, we're believers. We've seen 666 before. Where have we seen 666? Where, where, where is 666 in the Bible? It ain't in Genesis. It's in Revelation. It's in Revelation chapter 13. It's in Revelation chapter 13. I want to take y'all there. Revelation chapter 13, because this is not a coincidence. And it's the very last verse of Revelation chapter 13. So verse 18, this is where wisdom is needed. Those who understand should count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a person, and its number is 666. That's Revelation 13, verse 18. Now, what is the Lord trying to tell us with this word he came up with to express the, the, the vastness of this wasteness that's on earth with these three vibes in it. What is he trying to say to us? Let me give you a scripture that comes right before that. Go to Revelation chapter 12. Just turn the page over <laughs> to Revelation chapter 12. And I'm going to explain to you what's happening in verse two of Genesis chapter one, or what has happened when we get to verse two of Genesis chapter one. It's here in Revelation chapter 12. The end takes us right back to the beginning. 
So, because it's a full circle, the Lord's going to bring everything back full circle. So let's watch this. I'm reading out a complete Jewish starting in verse one of, of Revelation chapter 12. Now, a great sign was seen in heaven. This is going to be in the stars. That means among the stars, the Lord reveals a sign. A woman clothed with the sun, under her feet, the moon, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and about to give birth, and she screamed in the agony of labor. This is a constellation. This is actually the constellation of Virgo. Y'all know the different constellations that are in, in the sky? They're not so we can look at them and, and see if our boyfriend's cheating on us or we should marry this man. The Lord put the constellations there because he's actually prophesying. He's revealing his heart. He's revealing his will. And he put them there before he even put us on the earth. And so in the sky, he has revealed that he's creating humanity and the position they will have in his heart and in the universe, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and crowned with 12 stars. We're going to see this is Israel. The 12, you got the 12 uh, tribes of Israel. We got the 12 patriarchs of the body of believers, right? We see this government on this woman who is a pregnant, who is about to birth humanity. He has revealed it in the constellations that he's about to make humans. And look what happens next. Verse 3, and another sign was seen in heaven. There was a great red dragon, we know who that is, that's Satan, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads, on its heads were seven royal crowns. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of heaven. That's going to be a third of angels. And threw them down to earth. It stood in front of the woman about to give birth so that it might devour the child the moment it was born. So what is he trying to do? He's trying to destroy humanity. He realizes humanity is about to be created and he wants to destroy it. He, he, he disagrees with God about what God is about to do. No way you're about to do that. No way you're about to do that. I'm opposing you. And he then opposes God and takes a third of the angels with him. Now look at what happens in verse five. She gave birth to a son, a male child. It's going to be the, the, the first human, Adam. Adama <laughs> I means human. We'll see that in a minute. The one who will rule with all the nations with the staff of iron. And who comes from Adama? Our Messiah. He's the second Adam. But her child was snatched up to God and his throne. What happens? Our Messiah, he, he's crucified. He goes back up to heaven. He's the right hand of the father until everything is put under his feet. And she fled into the desert where she, where she has a place prepared by God so that she can be taken care of for 1,260 days. And, and this, this time of these, you know, uh, the three and a half years is going to speak of this time where he's ministering on the earth. It's going to speak of the time of tribulation. Like it's a time, it's, you're going to see that 1260 days repeat itself in throughout the human history. So many different times because he's fulfilling his prophecy on multiple levels that he put in the heavens. But look, let's look at this battle. Verse seven. Next, there was a battle in heaven. Mikael or Michael and his angels fought against a dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But it was not strong enough to win, so that there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown out. The ancient serpent, remember that it's called the ancient serpent, also known as the devil and Satan, the adversary, the deceiver of the whole world. He was hurled down to earth, and his angels were hurled down with him. Now, of course, it's going to... It, it, it's going to, there's, a, there's a, a song that goes forth about this accuser who's been hurled down to earth and all that's next, but we needed to read right there. Revelation 1, Re Revelation 12, verses 1 through 9. We needed to read those verses. Now we can go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. What is God trying to tell us about what has happened in the earth realm with this word tohu va bohu? He's telling us what he showed John. The enemy has been cast down to the earth. So when we see this, this waste, this desert, this vanity, look, look at that vanity is a part of that definition. Isn't that amazing? And who was the proud one? Who was the one who was first found with pride? It was Satan. So his pride and sin in the heavenly realm, his argument with God about creating humanity causes him and a third of the angels who agree with him because they thought they were magnificent and he shouldn't create anything else. 
especially not as it's going to be clothed with the sun, with the moon under its feet and have 12 stars on its head. So the angels are serving our purposes. And then there's going to be a man born who's then he's going to be God too. And what? No. Argument with God. They're cast down to earth. And that causes tohu ba bohu. Not just a loop, but a loopity loop. You see what I mean? It's like, I didn't tell y'all, what just tohu, y'all? It was tohu vavohu. Why the additional vavohu? Because there wasn't just the one vav, which is the connector. A vav is a connector. And, and we'll see vavs in these other words we're going to look at. God uses those vavs when he's connecting something to something else, and he's been very intentional in his purpose. He only needs one. He's the Aleph. He only needs one vav. And he can connect something to something, and it's established. Boom. Yes. Is it like an and when you say connector? It is like an and. It, yes, okay. it's like a conjunction. It is like an and. But it also, as a meaning of the letter, it connects ideas. It connects meanings. And you're going to see it when we look at the other words. Uh -huh. it, in every way, it's a connector. So it is a conjunction. Like va is a conjunction. <laughs> exactly. But the idea of the va being there is a connector to something. But when God connects, as we're going to see in these next words, he only needs one vibe. He's the Aleph. He needs one vibe. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. It connects this to this. It establishes it. It does what it's supposed to do. We got three vibes here. And those vibes have that numerical value of 666. And when you put them beside each other. If you just look at vibe and you got three of those vibes. Let me see. Wait, I went back to the wrong one. Go the other way. There we go. You got three of those vibes. Actually, it's kind of like claw prints. Like people see the monster drinks, it's got that claw. Va, va, va. <laughs> it's like, you understand what I mean? The enemy has now put his hooks in what the Lord is doing in the earth. Hence the chaos, the tohu va bohu, because he brought vanity with him. He brought a waste with him. And he's trying to hook to the other three things that are in that word tohu va bohu. He's trying to hook to fulfillment of purpose, top. He's trying to hook to the breath of life. Who did God give the breath of life to? Living creatures. He's trying to connect with them because the enemy doesn't have a body. He doesn't have that same breath of life. So he's trying to connect to our purpose. That's top, that, that, that letter all the way to the right. Purpose, completion of what God wants to do in us. So he shows up at the beginning. You see what I'm saying? To try to connect with our purpose. He's trying to dig his claws into our purpose. Then you see him trying to connect with the breath of life, everything breathing. And, and not just humans. The, the enemy tries to take over animals. Anything breathing, he tries to connect to because he's a different type of being. He's spirit. So he tries to connect with those things with the breath of life. And then you see Bet. He tried to put his claws into the house of God. Connect with what God himself is establishing as his own family. Because the angels aren't seen as God's family. We call them the sons of God. He calls us the sons of God. You see what I mean? So enemies like, let me put my claws in that thing. And, and it's the three vibes because when God uses the one hook, it's intentional. It's purposeful. He's doing one thing with it and it's going to serve multiple purposes, usually like a trifold purpose. When enemy does stuff, he mimics the ways of God. He's going to do it three times, but he's not intentional. He's chaotic with it. I just want to grab you. I don't know what I want to do with you, but I want to destroy you. I just, I just want to grab you. I want to get my hooks in you. I just want to, I just want to change this. I want to mess this up. I want to pervert this. I want to taint this. I want to touch this. That's what my plan. Is. That's the whole plan. I just want to put my hooks in. And this is what we see in this tohu vavohu. But the beauty is that it comes after bet. See, bet is the beginning. God had already established what He was going to do. <laughs> he already, He had already established what He was going to do. Then the enemy comes in. And he says, let me come and try to mess with what God is doing. Because I saw that sign in heaven. I don't like that. I don't like what he's about to do. And this is so important. We look at back at verse one. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens first. So that sign appeared. All this stuff is, is, is it's, 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 there's stuff there in the spirit realm. Now it's going to exist in the natural in a minute. But in the spirit realm, it all exists. The spirit exists first. Then we're going to see stuff happen in natural. When he does that, you know, all the stuff happens with the angels and all the stuff in the angels, that stuff is not described here. 
what we see describes what he does in the earth realm. He lets us know he created the heavens. But the rest of Genesis is about what he did in the earth. You see, it's all about, now let's, let me show you, let me make it manifest in a physical realm so my people can enjoy it because I've given them bodies and the breath of life. So it exists in the spirit realm. Now I got to manifest it for them so that it will exist in the realm where they have dominion because that's in the natural realm. That's where he's given us the dominion. You see that in this chapter. But the enemy says, oh no, I want to mess with their dominion. So he had to put his hooks in something because this is not his area of dominion. It's ours. And this is what we see happening here with the three vibes, with the 666 and God trying to show us there's a devil right there. You see him because we all go, how does serpent even get in the garden? And why is it walking around talking to Eve? Because it's the dragon. You, you see, we have all these questions. It's that dragon from Revelation 12. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Then we see this, this animal becomes a snake without legs. But it's the dragon from Revelation 12 that shows up and it's all in Eve's business and all talking to her and, and Adam and Eve is trying to put his hooks in what God has established. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. All right. So now we're going to stop there and we'll keep reading. Um, verse three. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. In the original Hebrew, he actually says, light be. And if you turn your next page, that's your, that's your next word, is light. And for us, as God is establishing or shalom, that's so important that we understand light, that we understand this word light. Praise God. Somebody put it in the chat. That, now that makes sense. I'm so glad that it does. <laughs> Amen. So as we, as we look at this light, First thing we're going to see is the father speaking. So the word comes forth out of his mouth. And who is the word? Yeshua. Mm -hmm. So this is where we see Yeshua. You see the father in verse one. You see the Holy Spirit in verse two. You see Yeshua right there in verse three because he is the word. The word comes forth out of the mouth of the father. Word. That is spoken word. And what does he say? Like be. And he uses that word or. Now this is what you're going to see in your next sheet. Light is or. Now, it's interesting because the way we write or is only two letters. It's O and it's R. But in Hebrew, or has three letters. You see that vav in the middle? See, now we recognize the vav. <laughs> it's because he's connecting something. Remember I told you the Aleph, that's that first letter of or is Aleph. The Aleph represents him. He's the principal thing. He's the first thing. Aleph represents him. Now, that last letter of or is Resh. Raish is going to make that R sound. It makes the, the R sound. Vav is the connector. Now, Raish, when we get to it, but I'm going to tell you what it is now. Raish is going to be the poor man, but without God. Let me tell you what that means. Because Dalit is a different Hebrew letter. It's the poor man with God, meaning like poor in spirit. Like Messiah said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. There's the kingdom of heaven, right? Poor in spirit, meaning I'm humble, but I trust the Lord. But Raish is the poor person devoid of God, meaning they're lacking everything. They don't have shalom. They're broken. They're without anything. They're without peace. They're without wholeness. They're without provision. They're without strategy and wisdom. They're without everything. So poor in every sense, not just not having finances. So the, the reality is Raish is us apart from God. That, that's us apart from God. And Raish is anything apart from God. Anything without God is going to be poor. It's going to be lacking. Does that make sense? It's going to be lacking. So Raish speaks of lack. But what does he do in or? He connects himself, the principal thing, with everything that's in lack. You see that like You see that? And so we got the Aleph making the all sound, that of or, that all sound. And then you've got the vav, which is going to take on a W form. So, oh, and then you've got resh, or, that's like, or, and we don't, it's not different syllables. Not like, oh, were, it's just, or, or. So you see, there's a third letter in there and our language is only two letters, but in Hebrew, it's aleph, vav, resh, or, or, but it means like. Why was that important? Because it's not just God and the things that are lacking. It's connecting God 
in an established and purposed connection, connecting God to the things that are lacking. Light in Hebrew isn't um, brilliance <laughs> of brightness. Light is to bring order to chaos. So after we had our tohu bavohu with the enemy, he speaks light be or, and he connects himself to everything that is lacking. And you start to see this in the whole rest of Genesis is he starts to speak and all this stuff comes to life. So or was not just, so when we think about light, light is in it, it, the concept, God's concept of light is to bring order to chaos. It, it invades darkness, not just darkness, but the void, the emptiness. It invades the waste. It invades the vanity. Or invades tohu vavohu. You, you see what I'm saying? Again, so, this is a salvation message. <laughs> you, you, there's our salvation right there. Look what the enemy did. And look what God did to connect to everything that's lacking. Intentionally, his light, because Yeshua is light. He is the light of the world. But then what does he do? He calls us to be the light of the world. And we can't be the light of the world because we're raised without God. But if I connect with God, the Vav, now I'm light. You see how that just happened? I'm raised without him, but with the Vav, the connection, and that connection goes to God. Now I'm light. Y'all see all that in the Hebrew? Like y'all do see it, right? You're not just going, because uh -huh, I need her to go on because I don't know what she's talking about. No. Like you see it, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. So he brings order to chaos. That's literally what that word or means in Hebrew. And it manifests as light. But it's God, God's order to the tohu vabohu. Amen. Okay, so when he calls us to, to be or shalom, remember this definition of or. He wants us to bring order to this chaos and the wholeness, shalom, to everything that's in that state of rash, lacking, poverty, missing, empty. That's what he's called us to be, or shalom. Does that make sense? So I told you I was excited about today because <laughs> so I'm looking at these words. Like, ah! <laughs> this is amazing. Somebody put that in the chat. Yes, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm very excited. So this is what we see. And this is, of course, what Yeshua is. Yeshua is the Allah connected to the race. He is God connected to everything lacking. That's who Yeshua is. He is the light. You, you see him? He is the order in the chaos. He is the answer to the tohu vavohu. Like, he, that's who Yeshua is. He is the light. So when he says, I'm the light, it's all that. Not just illumination. You see what I mean? All right, so that was verses one through three. Um, verse four, God saw that the light was good and God divided the light from the darkness. And that's your, your, your last word, good, um, which is gonna be very important here. And so when we look at good, it doesn't start with Tav. Good actually starts with Tet which is going to have that 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 uh, numerical value of uh, nine. Oh, I'm not sharing it with you guys online. Sorry about that. <laughs> I went on with you guys and I didn't share it with you guys online. All right, Tet. I want y'all to see um, Tove, because that's good. Good is Tove. He says Tove. It is good. And that Tove means beautiful. Um, it means uh, the way it's supposed to be. Isn't that nice? Working the way it's supposed to work. That's what told what good means to God. And so when he looks at him, he saw the light. It was good. It was working the way it was supposed to work because it's actually causing other things to work the way, it's, the way they're supposed to work. It's told. So it starts with tet. Now tet, that little, little letter you see all the way on, on the right. Tet is going to be, it can be two different things. Tech can be the serpent turned away from God and tech can be the man bowed down to God. Tech can be either one, the letter itself. But when you connect it with the house of God, see that last letter, that, that tov is, it's a bet or a vet. You see what I'm saying? It's making a V sound. 
it's the it's, it's not evolved it's evolved in the middle mm -hmm. but there's the bet at the end so when you connect that which could be a serpent turned away from god which is going to speak of satan that the letter tech is either serpent turned away from god or it's a man bowed down to god the letter itself is it has both of those meanings so if if tech could either be a serpent turned away from god and that's going to be us rebelling and being like the devil or it could be a man turned toward God and bowing to him, like literally bowing down before God. When he connects us to his house, we become part of God's household, we become good. Does that make sense? So tech by itself can either be good or bad. It can be good or bad, just like any one of us on any given day, in any given moment. I could be good this moment. I can be bad the next moment. I can have a good thought and then have a bad thought. I can say something good and then do something bad. Like I, I am capable of all of that. But if you vibe me, you connect me to the house of God that he established, I am good. And this is what God is saying about everything he creates throughout Genesis chapter one. He's going to keep saying, told, 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 told. It is good. It is good. It is good. And then on the day he makes us, he says, he told very good meaning we are working the way we're supposed to work we are beautiful in his sight because he has anchored us in his house you know like when lord says in, in john 15 you are on the vine you're the branches stay connected to me and you'll bear much fruit but apart from me you can't do a thing right this is right there in told in that word good connected to the house of god it's good but apart from it, told that that tap by itself, it could be a serpent that turns away. Did you want to say something back? Or you want to ask a question? I got it. You got it? Mm -hmm. So we see the first day is told. It's good. Told. It's good. And, and then we see next um, um, that he divided the light from the darkness. So we see God separating. This is important because we see in our culture all the mixture. This and that, this and that. You see it in religions, like, you know, the yin and the yang symbol. You see there's a little bit of good and bad, a little bit of bad and good, which pretty much teaches people to make peace with your demons. And then you will you will feel peaceful. But if you're not warring with the devil, you're going to feel a little bit of peaceful. But there's darkness at work in you. Mm -hmm. and, and then the way the, the, the society has us compromise, and compromise is going to give you peace. It's a false peace, though, because I have to bow down to darkness. Light does not do that. He literally, you see him separating light from darkness. And we see it in physics now. If you turn on a light, you're not going to see an area where there's light and darkness together. Either it's light or it's darkness. You're not going to say, well, it's kind of both of them. No, it's not. <laughs> it's either light or it's darkness. And he made that physical distinction to show us that in his kingdom, there must be a distinction. He is not about the mixture. Either it's the, the, the tech that's connected to him that's good or it's tech that's that serpent that's, that has turned away from him and it's by itself and it's not good. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. He's like, there's not a mixture. Either you're with me or you're not with me. <laughs> you're in my house or you're not in my house. So I'm going to separate light and darkness. So when you look at the physical world, you see that separation. You realize that I am a God who's calling you to make a choice. My door is always open to my house. Told. It's always open. But choose to connect to me and stay in my house. And then you won't be the serpent that turns away. So what happens with Adam and Eve when they listen to the serpent? So we got that tech, right? They, first they were bowed down to God, connected to his house. They turn, they listen to the serpent. They get disconnected from the house. You, you, see, you see how that plays out? And so it becomes so important here that we realize that this separation from light and darkness is God showing us, I don't want you to be mixed. I don't want you to be compromised. I want you to make a choice in everything and, and not that you have the power to do it. Remember, looking at that word toes, you don't have the power to do it, but stay connected to my house. I can empower you to make that choice for light rather than darkness at all times. In any given moment, when we're tempted to darkness. If we turn to him about that, <laughs> he connects us back to his house. We can continue in the light. Y'all see that dis distinction there and what he is calling us to himself, how he's speaking to us. Choose light, but you can't do it apart from me. Choose light in me. Choose light in my house and you will be good. 
And not just will we be good because we've been given dominion on the earth, things around us will be good. Look at the wickedness of man and the decay that it causes in the earth, the challenges it causes in the earth, challenges it causes in, in people's lives. Why? Because we're behaving like Satan, like the enemy that, that the serpent has turned away. But when we stay submitted to God and anchored in him, now things flourish, they grow, they prosper. And he knew that the enemy was going to try to present to us an option of compromise. Most of the time, the enemy is not going to say, forget God and join me completely. Usually he'll say, just do this. Just, just do that. Just do that. You know? <laughs> Just, you know, the point is to compromise. The enemy's point is to compromise us. As soon as he can compromise us, he can start to turn us away from God into the other direction. And everything that we now have dominion over is influenced by the enemy rather than being influenced by God. And the enemy is okay with, with partial. He's all right with having half of us. Because as long as he got half of us, God done got all of us. You, you right. see what I'm saying? Does that, he's fine with having a quarter of us. He's okay if we got a secret life over here and we still going and serving and worshiping. He's all right with that because he know that secret life over there is not devoted to God and he can cause some destruction from that part right there. Mm. He's all right with that. And so is the world. So is the world. But try to actually commit completely to life and see what happens. Now, the forces of darkness <laughs> are against you. You're going to see Revelation 12 in your life. The dragon pursues you. You're trying to birth light. You're trying to birth God's purpose. You're trying to birth what he's doing in the earth. And this becomes so important for us because as believers, even our faith, because all this stuff I'm telling you has been stripped from us. And, and, and we were told it wasn't important. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We were told, you don't need to know this. You don't need to connect with the roots. You don't need to, you know, just read it. You know, so you know a little bit. It's an allegory because, but because you know, the earth is millions of years old. This can't actually be literally true. It's nice poetic language for us to understand about God. We look at what the enemy has robbed us of so he can convince us to compromise and tell us that that's faith. No, this is, this is how it's supposed to look. You don't really need all that stuff. <laughs> you just need to, you know, do a little bit so you feel good about yourself. <laughs> and then come do what you really want to do. Which is not really what we do want to do because we haven't been designed for it. But when we sin, we begin to malfunction. And then the enemy tells us that's who you are. Sin is a malfunction. It's not the design. Because when he looked at us on day six, which we'll get to next week, early. <laughs> I told you, I know women's going to stop. I, I, honestly, I, I really thought we was going to get right, right about here. I really did, because there's so much need. Um, but when, when he looks at us on day six, he says, keto, very good. Because we were designed in a way that pleases him, and we did exactly what he designed us to do. So even when we malfunction, that door to his house is still open. We're still sons and daughters. He has not discarded us. And the devil is lying. But we can't buy into the lie of compromise. What fellowship can light have with darkness? Right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you now you understand these words, that means a whole lot more than just flipping, you know, people show you that light switch thing. That, oh, it means way more than just flipping on light switch, <laughs> turn the light switch off. It means way more than that. And this is every day he's calling us to, to recommit, come back into his house, be good anchored to his house and turn toward him in reverence. Every day, he's calling us to that every single day. And every day we have to recommit to it. And that's the point of this Bible study. It's not so you can go to work and be like, man, I know some Hebrew. Y'all wanna hear some Hebrew? Because most of these things, this is biblical Hebrew. The way you know um, conversational Hebrew is spoken nowadays doesn't sound exactly like this. You see them is, is, is a little different. Um, so it's not for that purpose at all. It's not for academic purpose. You can say, oh, we know these words. And it's so that you can live the life you were des designed to live. So that you can receive the promises of God that are all right here in the scripture that the enemy has kept us from understanding. Things are lost in translation. Things have been pulled away from us in religion. But it's right here in his love letter to us. I made a house. You're in that house. No matter what you do, I provided for you to come back to that house. 
So you can be anchored to me. You can be good. And you can be light because I am light. Amen. So I think that's a good place to stop. <laughs> and this is why I didn't make any goals. <laughs> because if I was like, oh, we got to get through Genesis chapter one. <laughs> we need to get to where he needs us to get to. <laughs> Amen. And next week, we probably won't have so much Hebrew, but this was foundational. Because I can come back to Beck, I can come back to Bob, I can, you know what I mean? I can, you got some stuff now that we can use. So when we're looking at other things, you can make the connections, the Bob, <laughs> the connector. Amen? Amen. Okay, so we're going to pray um, and, and, and allow God to just close this out. So Father, we just thank you for thinking about us from the beginning, for considering us initially, right as you were establishing the heavens, as you were establishing the earth, putting the prophecy in the heavenly realm of what you were going to do to birth humanity, sending Messiah and, and always having that as a plan. It wasn't a backup. It was always in your heart to redeem us. You weren't surprised by the enemy's little coup in heaven. You're not surprised by his temptations and disruptions in our lives. You're, you're not surprised by our sin. You're not surprised by our repentance. All of it is, is, is written in and you figured it in, but you're always calling us back to yourself. And we thank you for that. We thank you for, for having a door that is always open to us. We thank you, hallelujah, for having us on your heart that you would reveal spiritual truths in the natural world all around us, that everything in creation will point us right back to you. We thank you for, for, for ministering to us in such a way and we ask that you seal what you have, have deposited into us today with the blood of Messiah, that you allow it to take root deep down inside of us and bear fruit in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, Lord God, in our speech, in our interactions with each other, in our worship to you. Help us to turn toward you, bow down toward you, and, and be anchored to your house. Help us to run in through that open door and draw us to yourself. Give us discernment and wisdom of the text tactics of the enemy. Let us see it clearly. Let us see the dragon. Let us see the serpent. Let us understand that mixture leads to destruction and instead resolve not to compromise and repent quickly when we do. We praise you for your great grace upon us, Lord God. And I bless you for every person who's watching this. I bless you for every person who's here. We thank you for, for, for helping us to press through the technology issues. We ask that you continue to bless that aspect. Bless holy ground for allowing us to be here, Lord God. And we thank you for all you are and for all you're doing. Keep us safe until we come back together again. And even uh, beyond that, until we are together with you, face to face in your presence. We praise you for them now. We give you the honor and the glory. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. I've thoroughly enjoyed y'all tonight and I look forward to next week. I'm sorry it's so short, but I can't keep you forever. So. <laughs>